some of the more recent studies and some of the more recent projects I've been working on, we're seeing lower lameness prevalence. So that's more promising, but we're still having individual farms where their overall lameness prevalence is like 40% for lactating cows. And I think as an industry to talk about whether or not we're, you know, we need to keep working on it. I think definitely it's, it's one of the most obvious welfare concerns on a dairy farm. Hello and welcome back to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Lindsay Ferlito. Lindsay, thanks for joining us on the Dairy Podcast Show. Thanks for having me. So Lindsay is a dairy specialist with the Cornell University Cooperative Extension North Country Regional Ag Team. She's focused on cow comfort, lameness, cow behavior, calf housing, and also promoting the dairy industry. Uh, Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this line of work? Where, where did you grow up? How did you find your way into a dairy uh, world? Sure, yeah. Um, so I did not grow up on a farm. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So I went to school at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I did my undergrad in just kind of um, generic animal biology. Not really sure what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to work with animals, but didn't know what that looked like. And I kind of just lucked into it. I was um, not doing anything related to biology. And I had a friend that was working at the UBC Dairy Research Center. And she said, there's a a researcher here who has an internship opening. He needs to fill it by tomorrow. So he's going to call you today and offer you the position. So um, I took it and I started working with calves and helping out with some calf research. And I loved it. So I then just basically kept finding ways to stay at the farm. Uh, So I started working as a research tech for the UBC Animal Welfare Program and got to work on the farm a little bit more and then realized if I wanted to keep doing this, I should probably go back to school. So I then started my master's with the Animal Welfare Program at UBC um, and focused on dairy cattle feeding behavior and cow comfort. Um, And then I graduated in 2011 And I moved to the U.S. Um, At the time, UBC had a partnership with Novus International to do the COWS program, doing cow comfort assessments across the country. So I came out to New York for what was supposed to just be a few years to get some experience. Uh, And then I met my husband, who's from here. So I ended up staying and I worked for Novus for almost five years and then transitioned to working for Cooperative Extension about six and a half years ago now. Awesome. Okay, so where where exactly in the state of New York do you live and work then? Um, I'm in northern New York, so I'm just south of south of Watertown. So I'm about 35 minutes from the Canadian border and about 15 minutes from Lake Ontario. Okay, so you, you mentioned that you had done some work with the Cows program, um, and if I understand correctly, in that program you were assessing herds all over the U.S., running all over the place constantly. And, you know, you've probably seen more farms in different regions of the country than just about anybody out there, particularly for the stage of your career. Did you have any big takeaways from that, you know, going across dry lot dairies in the southwest to, you know, tie stalls in New England? Um, Any big picture, you know, thoughts you can share? Yeah, it was uh, it was eye opening Um, and it was pretty it was pretty awesome for like you said someone who's younger in my career when i started that and not coming from a dairy farm i had a very limited understanding of what a dairy farm looked like um, especially coming from british columbia and the canadian system and then moving to new york uh that was a change and then like you said being able to see pretty much every way you can dairy it was a really neat opportunity for me um and definitely a learning experience it was cool to see that there are so many different ways within the country that we can, that we can do this and still have awesome cow comfort and good production and good cow health. Um, and that every region has its unique challenges. Um, you know, what weather, water, land availability, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a good way to basically see every way that it can be done. And I'm curious from that experience, I'm going to, I'm going to rule out New York. Okay. So that you can't feel any pressure. Like if there was one part of the country where you just really loved sort of the surroundings or what it was like to be on a dairy there, what, what would it be? Uh, it's funny because actually someone just asked me that the other day, what what was my favorite place to travel to? And I had to pause. And then I think I listed every place with a different reason why. Um, 
I, I, I liked the Pacific Northwest, I think just because it re- reminded me of home. Um, sure. But I also liked, I, I liked Wisconsin too. And I don't know if that's also because it kind of reminded me of New York state, but I liked the, you know, the rolling green hills. Yeah. A lot of farm country, um, but still very picturesque. Nice. Okay. Fair enough. So I understand that a key part of your current role is to help farms to understand and prepare for farm animal care program evaluations. Uh, can you give me a brief overview of this program and can you start with defining FARM, that acronym? Sure. Um, so FARM is Farmers Assuring Responsible Management. So it's the FARM Animal Care Program came, comes from the National Milk Producers Federation. And it started in 2009 as a very much a voluntary program. And then it has come out with new versions every few years. And in 2017, version 3.0 came out and that's when the program gained a lot more teeth um, and a lot more cooperatives decided to opt into it and basically make it a a mandatory thing for their participating farms uh, to be involved in. And the main reason I became a certified evaluator, I don't, you know, I don't work for farm. I just do it to help the farms in my region. When that new version of 3.0 came out, that was when um, tail docking was no longer allowed and there was a lot of misinformation coming out and it just seemed like a lot of farms were unsure what the actual requirements were, what it meant for them. So at Extension, we just figured we should get you know, up on the knowledge and be able to help them with what's actually needed. So it's a program designed to kind of outline some targets and some guidelines that farms need to work towards, outline some best management practices and be used as a tool to help ensure consumers and purchasers that dairies across the country are following these best management practices and, you know, continually trying to improve. Yep. Okay. Very good. So um, to be frank, I haven't spent a whole lot of time, you know, working with that program. I'm vaguely familiar with it, but if, if I understand correctly, there's sort of like minimum expectations and then there's sort of aspirational ones as well. So assuming that's correct, can you talk me through what are some of the most common areas where farms still need to work to achieve those sort of aspirational levels, if you will? Yeah, there's a few different parts. So there's a big component of it is paperwork and documentation. And then there's also on-farm evaluation where they walk through the animals, um, assess you know calves, lactating cows for things like body condition score, lateness and hygiene a lot of farms um, are doing well overall on the animal observations. There's sometimes where there's, you know, we're not quite meeting a certain target, but I feel like the paperwork is a big thing that, that (laughs) becomes an issue. Um, So they have to have a a herd health plan, a written herd health plan reviewed and signed annually by the vet of record, as well as the signed vet client patient relationship form. And those are the two of the things that are, uh, most likely to cause an issue just that it hasn't been reviewed by the vet or they've changed vets in the last year. Um, there's also now more and more paperwork. So I think that's the last couple of versions have added a lot of um, documentation and, and paperwork. So it's been a challenge for some farms that historically haven't had to have a lot of paper documentation, um, continuing education credits for workers that have animal care responsibilities training records and things like that. Um, So thankfully, those are all relatively simple things to work with farms on. And it's just a matter of kind of getting them a list of what they need and then figuring out how they can get it done. Okay. Yeah, working in universities, we don't understand anything about paperwork, right? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) written protocols. That can be frustrating, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So uh, one of the topics I believe that's part of the farm program is, you know, housing and a piece of that is stocking density. So we know, you know, you've spent a lot of time looking at that as a component of the work you've done around lameness. Um, so first of all, if you think about stocking density, do you typically assess this with respect to stalls relative to cows or is it more on bunk space or how do you think about that? The first thing I usually think of is stalls um, because to some degree, feed bunk space is linked to that. But yes, yeah, so the first place I usually look is stalls. So how many stalls are there how many cows are there and then how much feed bunk space is there how much water space is there and kind of a general idea of how much access do they have to those resources so you could have really low stocking density but if your cows are spending six hours a day outside the pen for milking or two hours a day in lockup then you don't really have that many stalls for cows because they don't have access to them when they want to um 
So looking at all those pieces together, but yeah, the first place I usually look is stalls and then feed in the water. That's a really good point. Maybe a better metric is actually hours of stall availability per cow or something like that. A little more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay. So what, what are you seeing lately on farms that you're on in your region? Is it pretty common for farms in your area to have 30% more cows than stalls or something in that range? Yes. Uh, so that I think that was also one of the things that was um, a learning experience in my previous role was seeing the differences and definitely recognizing that in the Northeast, we do tend to overcrowd our cows more than other areas of the country. Um, I do think we've made some improvements. I feel like when I first moved to New York uh, 10 years, 11 years ago now, uh, it was very common for people to be stocking at 130. I feel like we're closer now to about like 115, 120. That being said, we definitely still have farms that are that are in that um, 130 percent. It also depends on the animals, too. So we've got farm like we just did a study and we had even within the farm big variations. Like there was a pen of low cows that were severely overcrowded. And then thankfully, the lactating and, and fresh cows are not as overcrowded. So still seeing it in some areas and on some farms. But I think we're getting a little bit better at recognizing some of the longer term potential negatives. So it's come down a little bit. So, yeah, you mentioned the potential long-term negative effects. I want to dig into that. A lot of farms that I talk to, the it's maybe not said explicitly, but the implicit assumption is that if we're overcrowding cows, we're either going to see it in an obvious drop in feed intake and milk production or in an obvious uptick in lameness and other clinical disease. So, in many cases, farms that are sort of pushing things a little bit in terms of stocking density will point to their health records and their productivity and say, um, you know, we should be fine because these these numbers are well within the normal range in the industry. So how do you think about that? Yeah, and that's, I think, I think you're exactly right. I think that's the challenge with stocking density is it's such a simple thing to change. You know, you have a pen of 100 cows. It's really easy to throw five more cows in there and then continue on your day. Um, And I think it's then hard to track when you made that management change today, some of the potential negatives are going to take months and maybe years to show up in the sense of, we know that if we overcrowd in certain pens, it does have a negative impact on reproduction. So at what point do you determine that a drop in your repro can be tied back to the fact that you started increasing stocking density in certain pens at some point months ago? Or same with lameness. Lameness can take months to fully appear. So again, how do you, it's a little bit harder for us to say, oh, well, it's clear three months ago you increased your stocking density. Now you have more lameness. So I think it's a harder thing to prove that those are the negative impacts. And it's a little bit easier to put those cows in the pen, maybe see a little bit of increased milk if you're milking a couple more animals. So it seems like a good thing, but it's harder to fully understand the cost in the end. Right. Is, is there a, a way that you find is, is more successful to talk through this? If you're, if you're, let's say, for example, you're on a farm and you're pretty convinced that they're overstocking. Um, how do you typically go about trying to convince the management team that a change should be made? Is it trying to do some return on investment math or how, how do you address that? Yeah, usually involving some some rough math of some economics. And I do like to start with the science of we have the studies to show that it will potentially have these these negative impacts on repro and, and hoof health um, and some you know behavioral impacts. So starting with kind of just, I guess, like the basics in that sense, trying to put some numbers to it. And then depends on the farm. Like there's one I have a better relationship with and we're you know, I'm part of the, like their, their management meetings and they talked about adding another 12 cows to the pen. And so I just piped up and I was like, please don't. (laughs) And let's talk about why (laughs) they, you know, we were able to kind of joke about it, but um, another, another kind of approach would be just asking them, like, what do you think would happen if we, if you just sold five cows? Like if I go through and find five lame cows and you sold them, see what happens. And if your bulk tank doesn't change, you're feeding five fewer cows. You don't have five lame cows to worry about and then see how many times I can convince them to do that. (laughs) Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. 
So you, you brought up lameness a couple times there. Let's let's dig into that a little bit. So you clearly have a lot of expertise there. You've got a lot of background. What's your current assessment of the lameness issue in the U.S. dairy industry as a whole? Do you think we're making progress? Yes, I, that's a tough question because I do think it's it's something that we need to make more progress on. Um, but I do think we have made some progress. When I when I first was doing cow comfort assessments, especially in the Northeast, there was a lot of farms that we did that had um, higher than industry average uh, lameness and severe lameness. And that was a little bit, I guess, surprising too, just see some of the regional differences in lameness. Some of the more recent studies and some of the more recent projects I've been working on, we're seeing lower lameness prevalence. So that's more promising, but we're still having individual farms where their overall lameness prevalence is like 40% for lactating cows. And I think as an industry to talk about whether or not we're, you know, we need to keep working on it. I think definitely it's, it's one of the most obvious welfare concerns on a dairy farm. If someone walks on a farm and doesn't exactly know what they're looking at, they don't know if a cow has mastitis or metritis or, you know, potentially milk fever if she's just laying there. But if she has to walk and she's lame, it's obvious she's lame. So, it, and we know it causes pain and we know there's a lot of negative economic impacts as well to the farm. So I do think it's an area that that needs to continually be worked on, um, but I, I think it is promising that we're seeing seeing some improvements overall. Okay, all right. So, you know, as you said, it's it's something that needs to be top of mind for the industry to keep working on. In that vein, what do you think are some of the biggest contributing factors for lameness on different farms? Well, I think that has been that has been a shift too. I feel like in the last ten years or so, I don't. More recently now, I'm not having to have the conversation um, with people about talking about how it's not just a nutrition thing. I feel like maybe like 10 or so years ago, it was very much, oh, well, let's look at the diet. And yes, that plays a role. But I, I personally feel like when I'm assessing lameness now, it's more management and facilities related. So ultimately coming down to where are we asking her to lay down? How big is it? How soft is it? How much access does she have? Is there bedding? and working on ways to tweak that. So basically making sure that our, if we're talking about a freestall, that our stalls are designed appropriately to fit those animals. We're giving her the time of day to lie down and that we're giving her soft, adequate bedding to do so just to get her off her feet and, and have some time to rest and, and recuperate. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in that respect, is it is it common that you see less lameness issues on pretty new facilities, you know, assuming they design stall sizes appropriately, or is that not necessarily true? That's a hard one too. Um, and I think that some of the notice data tried to look at barn age, and I think they found that it was, a fa and I think one of the things with the Northeast was that we had more older barns compared to say California or Wisconsin. Um, I, I do think if we, yes, like if you've designed a brand new free stall, the stalls are designed appropriately. We put in new mattresses or deep beds and bed it appropriately. Um, the main concern would just be to make sure the flooring is done properly and we're not having, you know, we'll have some, some wear on new concrete. But yeah, if we're talking about um, a new facility, yeah, I would hope that we'd see a reduction in lameness. And that's why I, I am intrigued with some of the robotic milking systems and some of the data. Um, and I'd like to see, and maybe it's out there and I just need to be, find it, um, but more data on farms that transition. We talk a lot about when the farm transitions to robotic, you know, production goes up and this stuff goes up, but a lot of times they also built a new barn. So. Right. Yeah. It's a bit confounded. Yeah. Like yes, lameness went down and production went up and all these great things. Um, but if you had just built a brand new barn anyways, what would the differences have been? And I, I 100% think robots are, are really cool, but I just think it's it's interesting to see the ones that have transitioned to robots and kept their facilities and um, and what aspects the robot itself just changed versus an, a brand new barn. That would be interesting. Yeah, because there's quite a few retrofits as well. Yeah. Sounds like a good project for you, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll like... check back in a year. <laughs> So you brought up, that's one example of, of something a farm can do. Obviously, you can invest in new facilities, but that's a, a large capital outlay. Are there some other successful approaches you've seen farms take that, um, you know, you can think of some great success stories where they implemented X and they've really saw an improvement? 
yeah, and I'm probably biased because part of my job is to track and record lameness, but I really think farms that put make, to make, make lameness a priority. So having someone, whether it's an extension person or a consultant or someone on, on the farm staff, keeping track of things, because I feel like lameness is one of those things too, where you can kind of just, you know, if within a reason you kind of just let it go and it might start to creep up and it gets higher than you'd want before you really fully recognize that it's gotten that bad. So I think having a plan in place to regularly monitor where you're at and then be able to adjust if you see an increase or if you do see a decrease, what, what was it attributed to? Let's do more of that. Um, one, one cool thing that a farm I work with does, they have a, a map of the whole barn in the office where everyone can see it with all the pens laid out. And every time there's a, a bad lame cow identified, they put a pin in her pen to show where those lame cows are showing up and start to see if it's certain parts of the barn, were those cows slipping more? Is it the older part of the barn? So, okay, those stalls are older and not as nice and try to identify some trends. And plus it's also very obvious. So everyone sees a bunch of red pins glaring at them in their face that lameness is a problem. Um, and so that's really cool. And they actually have done some, they've regrooved some things and put in some rubber um, and the number of pins that are popping up now is, is a lot less. I like that. I've never heard of that. That's a good idea. Okay. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, calf facility design, another area of, of interest for you. Um, I guess I'd start with what are some of the most common problems you see with calf housing? Yeah. So uh, calf housing is something I've started to work more on the last couple of years. It's definitely not something I was trained on originally, but it thankfully is something now that I feel a lot of producers are asking more about. Um, which I think is a, a positive shift from, obviously, it's been a rough few years for the dairy industry, many different reasons, um, but we're getting a lot of calls now looking at focusing on young stock housing and trying to improve things there. So I think that's a, a positive indication. Um, so we started working at Extension, started working a lot more on, on calf barn facilities and management and ventilation seemed to be one that we we're getting a lot of questions on. So we actually designed a project last year and it was um, a small scale, more like um, observational project, but we looked at some calf health and ventilation on various different facility types across Northern New York. And one of the things that we did was we um, smoked the barns. So we fogged the barns and saw if farms were getting adequate ventilation. And it was really interesting because we had some very simple designs. We had 100% natural ventilation all the way up to like the most um, tech, you know, technological, the most number of fans, um, pretty intense designs. And it was just neat to see some of the different challenges that, that came out because it is, I think one of the biggest things is how do we, especially in Northern New York or Wisconsin or other parts, how do you ventilate a barn, but also not freeze these tiny little babies with very little body fat? Um, I think we're we're getting towards understanding that we're historically have not probably done a great job at, at providing fresh air. Um, and there's some new ways to, to try to do a better job of that. Great. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you, so what are some of the innovations uh, you're seeing that are helpful? So that's a great one to focus on. What, how is it that we're, that, you know, we can deliver fresh air without freezing these calves? Yeah. And I think I, I overall design and in general making sure that we're housing these animals appropriately so they have enough space it's always a little bit easier when they're not housed with older animals so that that sometimes the challenge when we're trying to have either even in like a tie stall facility where maybe the lactating animals are still kind of connected so we're getting some of the the dirty air commingling from them um or having you know huge weaned heifers at the end and we obviously need more air for them but we don't want to chill the younger one so making sure that we're designing our facilities with the young calf in mind um a few different ways like i said there was a couple farms we had that were purely natural ventilation and just they worked really well um one had um fans in the chimney so i guess it wasn't totally natural but some very simple designs but like i said they were they were built with that in mind so very tall sidewalls uh, orientation was appropriate. Stocking density was very low, so they had a lot of space in the barn per calf. Uh, another tool that we're seeing being used more is positive pressure tube ventilation. So it's a, usually a pretty simple, cost-effective way to bring in air into the barn in a very uniform fashion, um, especially if we had you know small 
individual or rows of individual pens um, or, or group pens, and we can just run a tube over each row to bring in some fresh air at the bare minimum for winter exchange. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Anything else? Like, are you seeing in your region um, quite a bit of shift to paired or group housing? And if that's the case, what, what kind of renovations or retrofits are people doing? Uh, actually, I want to do a project on that. Um, we have to figure out how to how to design it. Um, we there's a small shift. It's um, I don't think we have a, I, I wouldn't say we have a shift to pair housing yet, and that's why I want to try to start looking into that and, and promoting it. We have some farms that are doing groups. We have um, a small percentage that are doing the large groups with either robotic feeders or mob feeders. From some of the work that um, a previous colleague and then myself did was looking at um, different strategies for group housing. And, and it seems, and, and also just talking to producers lately uh, with the really large groups, the really large groups seem to be a challenge. It's, um, I think when you look at like robotic feeders in Europe or Canada, the groups are usually like 10 to 12 calves. Um, economics obviously is different in the US. But we tend to see, at least in northern New York, like 25 calves per robotic feeder. And that just is such a challenge. You need definitely need the right person doing it. It's very hard to manage 25 calves in a pen, um, even with that extra data. So we're seeing some, some good success with farms that are running smaller groups on mob feeders, like eight calves, nine calves. Um, so I do think there's, there's some, some room there for some more farms to shift. And I think with the pair housing again, you're going to need to do some management shifts, but it's really not that big of a, of a difference if you have individual pens or if you have hutches to even after like a week, just remove the divider. And then, um, and it's actually really cool because even just talking to a farm that didn't really think that they, you know, were a big uh, proponent of, of pair housing, but then they talked about how, you know, at some point they, some of them did get removed and they were paired and it was really cool to see like, oh, they were way better. They were way better at adjusting to the new groups and they found grain way faster. And I'm like, that's, so it was just cool the way they were like just reiterating yeah. all the things that we've shown from scientific studies and they had just kind of happened upon it on their own farm. So I would, part of my job too, I like to try to capture those stories because as much as producers might call me to ask, you know, for recommendations, a lot of times they ultimately want them to hear from a farmer that's done it. So we really try to capture those success stories and those case studies to share them. Um, so that's what I would like to try to do too, is work with farms that are transitioning to pair or small groups and then kind of walk through what challenges they've had and, and how they've been able to be successful doing it. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. We like to wrap up every interview with a couple bigger picture questions. It's kind of fun to see what people answer. So I'm going to start with this. If you could put up some kind of magic billboard that everyone in the world could see, what would it say? Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people have said to this. Um, and mine's not at all insightful. Um, just that cows are awesome and they're smarter than you think they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's your favorite dairy related book or resource? Um, I think, so I think there's a lot of really good extension resources. Obviously Cornell extension has some, some really good ones and, um, Penn state has one, but I also think the university of Wisconsin, the Dairyland initiative is an amazing resource that's free and available to producers. They have a lot of, um, very, uh, you know, new updated recommendations for housing and facilities and management. So I think that's probably one of my favorites. Great. What about your favorite book or resource outside of ag? That's always a hard one. Um, so I'm going to answer it by not answering it. I like <laughs> uh, audiobooks because I have to drive so much for yep. my job. Um, and then anything, I like historical fiction related to World War II. So not one particular one, but anything kind of in that area. Okay. And then last of all, in your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those that are less successful? <laughs> I think it's it's the desire to continually improve and to be innovative and and curious and want to try new things. So like I have one of the farms I've worked with, they were on a, a cow comfort study and there was a benchmark and stuff and I gave them their, their data and they had 10% lameness overall, whereas the benchmark was like 20. And they were like, what? Why are we 10? Why aren't we lower than 10? 
so just always wanting to improve like you know they could have just been like sweet we're one of the best farms we're good right but no it still wasn't good enough they wanted to figure out how they could lower that so i think just those farms that are always thinking about what can we do better how can we get there what's the next step and just kind of pushing those limits yeah it makes sense hard to argue with that well, Lindsay Ferlito, thank you so much for joining us on the Dairy Podcast Show. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for having me. This was fun. And uh, thanks for listening. And be sure to hit subscribe so you can catch all these great episodes. Take care. <laughs>